Welcome to A Tech Monday Uganda that's brought to you by the Mastercard Foundation in partnership with Innovation Village through the EdTech Lab. EdTech Monday Uganda is a platform to engage Uganda's EdTech community and other relevant stakeholders that include the government, the private sector and the donors on the emerging topics of education and how technology can address these challenges. Of course, EdTech Monday Uganda is held once every month and we aim to dissect the education sector, the future of education and the available opportunities to grow this sector. Now it's 2022 and the world is entering its third year in the pandemic. In 2020, we observed the havoc it created in the education world, disrupting the learning, negating the various gains of the last decade, from better access to education to social well-being and improved inclusivity of learners. In 2021, as the shocks wore off, governments took to improving policies and plans. The private sector advanced great innovative solutions to mitigate the loss of learning, technology being the focal point of these interventions. And while the development world encouraged better understanding of the challenges for educators and learners and stimulated the implementation of suitable solutions to be rolled out in scale. By all accounts, this pandemic and its effects will be felt in 2022. We're not expecting things to go back to normal anytime soon, but will the education sector ever return to normal? Have we learned some important lessons in improved teaching and learning so that not only are we more resilient to the loss of learning future disruptions, but also manage to pave way for improving the education outcomes? Now, for our first EdTech Monday of 2022, Joining me in studio today are our expert panelists. We have Dr. Justin Namalwa Jumba, who is a coordinator for the MasterCard Scholars Program at Mackay University, a senior lecturer and head of department for environment management. We have Gilbert Gift Sima, who is an ICT and multimedia at the National Curriculum Development Center, and Irene Nyangoma, who is an education specialist and the head of curriculum learning at Clark Junior School. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much. So rare to have more ladies than gentlemen <laughs> on a show. But maybe I'll start uh, with you, Dr. Justin. Um, through the pandemic, what's the one thing that you've learned about the role that technology has played in enabling education to continue? Through the pandemic, one thing I have learned both as a parent and an academician and a manager of a program is we need to move fast. But we also have to note that everybody shall move at a different pace, but we must have a direction to go and a guided direction. There is no turning back, but we need to move and to move now because the rest of the world has actually moved on and there's no point of turning back. Uh, Gilbert, the, the, the new curriculum coincided with almost the start of the pandemic. So for you, it must have been a little bit more technical um, on, on what technology could play in, in education. What have you observed from the Curriculum Development Center about the role of technology? From the time we started our very, very first lockdown, key lessons from the education sector, one of them was it is possible to have virtual learning in Uganda. <coughs> we did not anticipate having teachers teaching over Zoom before the pandemic. We did not anticipate that you would prepare a document and disseminate it throughout the country through WhatsApp. We did not ever imagine that our children in middle class would manage or attend a lesson using their phones or tablets or what. But Throughout the, the pandemic, we learned that it is possible to have virtual learning in Uganda. We only now need to plan for it and have it streamlined. Mm. Uh, Nyangoma, you are in, in classrooms with um, children who've been learning during the pandemic. Many of them have had to learn from home. What have you observed about the role that technology played in enabling these children continue the curriculum during the pandemic? So the pandemic presented a really interesting challenge. Um, we were completely caught off guard. And as teachers and facilitators of education, we just had to find a way to continue to be relevant. So that was our challenge. That was a big challenge. And I know we all panicked. So as um, Clark Junior School, we, we saw it as an opportunity. Initially, we were, you know, 
we were confused, but then quickly embraced the most basic um, technological device, which is the phone. And um, we started up WhatsApp groups, so which kept our parents and us, uh, us communicating. So we, it has proved to be very, very interesting because we've been forced to adapt. We've been forced to, to embrace the challenges and keep learning going. Yeah, so we've also been forced to be even more creative, more innovative. So we started out with WhatsApp as a school, and I know that various schools embrace different you know, um, options. So we started out with WhatsApp and then embraced television. So we moved from the one small device to a bigger device and, um, yeah, and came up with, imagine teachers, it's, it's interesting to teach while the, the children are right in front of you. But now you're forced to carry on <laughs> learning <laughs> while the students are, are in their homes, mm -hmm. you know. So we did the best that we could. I want to bring Dr. Justin back. Uh, everyone speaks of the pandemic as having been an accident, but nobody got warning about the pandemic. Um, everyone had to learn how to work. Um, people learned how to work from home. Others had to remodel their business. Um, but a lot of this infrastructure, uh, particularly ICT infrastructure in education, existed before the pandemic. It wasn't taken advantage of. What have we learned about the role or the power that ICT had before and now it being at the core of, of education? Actually, like you have mentioned, ICT was always there. The rest of the world has always had e-learning. Uh, like the university has always had an institute for distance learning, but it was only a small group following because we are so used to the traditional mode of learning. And like uh, Nyangoma has mentioned, for me, it was really an interesting challenge because two, in, in two ways. One, for those who are able, were able to wake up and move to the next level. But then I'm more concerned about the exclusivity of the ICT-based learning. I think quite a number of our own have been left behind. So then the question is, how is this aspect of inclusivity going to be addressed if one Uganda is going to move in the same direction? The situation that Nyangoma is talking about, interesting, but for a small segment in Kampala and a few uh, districts, we have quite a number now, mm -hmm. with a bit of infrastructure. So ICT learning has been there, but the supportive infrastructure, the key enablers, which is electricity, connectivity, and the cost of internet. I'm sure all parents are crying. Why well, would love to give our children the phones, but they say MBs, MBs. Now, if a parent in Kampala is complaining of MBs, but he's also on WhatsApp once in a while. How about our colleagues be below Kampala and beyond? So the technology has been there, but the supportive infrastructure has not extended to cater for inclusivity. Mm. Uh, Gilbert, we are never going to have a, a perfect set of circumstances. So how do we work with what we have? We have always had this technology around us. Before the pandemic, we had WhatsApp. Mm -hmm. We had television, mm -hmm. we had radios, all these we had. I did a demonstration lesson on one of the television stations in Uganda. There were eight lessons where I tried, because teaching and learning is different from any other program on television. Mm -hmm. We have also been forced to learn methodologies that are different from what we are used to. Because teaching and learning through television, we learned is very different from what happens in a physical classroom. Nyangoma, uh, how do you reconcile the, the, the question of interactivity? Um, if you're teaching on a TV screen, how do you get interactivity from the learner? How do you measure the learning outcome from each lesson that you've, you've given a, a child? Um, that, is, that is very difficult because um, without hearing from the learner, you know, you cannot tell whether they have actually um, understood the concept, you know. So, um, and I, I really like what um, you, have, you have commented on, that the, the infrastructure is, is maybe could be better, but there's some systems in place 
multimedia systems in place that we could use to further enhance learning. And um, just like you, I was also privileged to be a part of a, of a show, um, very interactive, and even that was a new experience for me. So, um, and the engagement for this particular show wasn't, it was supposed to be more student-centric. So how do we get them to engage? We get children on the show. So unfortunately, because the pandemic um, had closed down <laughs> movement, what happened? Because the idea was to have children actually ha um, running the show. So that's how we wound up doing the show as the teachers. And um, we found it very, very interesting because we had to employ, like um, um, the previous speaker said, Gilbert said, um, th like Gilbert said, mm -hmm. it's, 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 it's interesting. How do you teach? What is learning? You know? Um, so we had to come up with a way to pick the interest of, of the learners. Um, the show was called, an, um, it's called Engine. I don't know if you've heard of it. So it's called Engine um, from Engine. And it's, um, the, the show is actually running. There was season one, 13 episodes, and the season two, which actually was launched by the US ambassador in November, 2021. So what is interesting is we've gotten feedback just like you that children can learn when they're at home. So we had animated videos, so it was, and there's not much content. The reality is, if you look at the, the available options on TV, what is available that's interactive, that's interesting, is made by people who are based elsewhere, in the US, in all these countries. There's no African content. Yeah, Dr. Justin, if we could come to you. We tend to imagine that distractions are reserved for only the, the young learners. They are worse amongst the, uh, the, the adult audiences like universities. People have social media, job opportunities opened up during the pandemic for young workers. Um, how do you keep the attention of the adult learners? The issue of inclusivity is beyond the infrastructure. It's a lot to do with the mindset change. Have we as the key stakeholders, that is the parents, the learners and the instructors, have had a mindset change? Because if that is not there, and first of all, the print is like, oh, I have stigma if I hand over my phone, oh, 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 we're gonna go into the wrong pages. That is done. And if the child already thinks, I've always longed to access, uh, you know, Facebook and everything. The moment I get it, that's the first thing I go to. As an instructor teacher in the university, I'm like, well, I think now it's easy for me. I just put up a few notes and uh, post. So each of us is not playing their part. So first is a mindset change, which is part of the inclusivity. I want to appreciate what Gilbert has said that, uh, yeah, infrastructure is actually out there. You find everybody in the remote area with WhatsApp, but they don't, they don't want to get into the MBs of learning, but the MBs of WhatsApp. So mindset change to appreciate the benefits that ICT is bringing on board. A point to note is we are in an open village. The world of work is open. When it's time to run an interview for a job, they will not say, for those from the developed world, your criteria is less because you guys had challenges of internet. And those of the, they will always have the same criteria. And our people, our children, shall always be disadvantaged. Now, with that in mind, it goes back to my first statement. We are led. How do we pass up? Because the world of work, where these learners are going, is open to everybody from Kansas to Canada to Toronto to, to Uganda, Apache, and you know, wherever you're talking about. So how do we pace up? The distractions are many, but they can only be mitigated by a mindset change. Can, can we help this learner focus for just 45 minutes? As teachers, we have to think creatively on how we are teaching if we are to use technology. It will not be productive for us to get all these devices and put them everywhere if we have not worked on our teaching and learning methodologies. They are very key. Um, how do you create interactive content? Um, or what have you learned during this period of creating content about interactivity to make that content interactive with learners 
and now that schools have reopened, what are your students telling you about what they learned whilst they were in, in, the, in the lockdown? Like Gilbert mentioned, methodology is key. And um, I think what the pandemic has taught us is that learning can go, continue, even across different media. So the point is, what have we learned, like you say, what have we learned from our interactive engagement using media? I think we can employ those very same strategies because we had to think outside the box. We had to be creative. We had to actually think about how do I draw the learner in? How do I keep them engaged? And it's the same idea, the same mindset that we need to have as teachers. Instead of um, simply going and um, talking down to the students, we can we can draw them in. How do we do it? Have some fun, engaging activities related to the topic, of course, you know. Um, tell stories, you know, tell stories. So, of course, my, my, my focus is the younger children, <laughs> but I believe that all, everyone loves a story, you know. So how do we, the question is, um, as um, Gilbert actually was, was highlighting during the break, yes. The question is, are we prepared as educators to, to not just talk the talk, to actually walk the talk and teach? So the point is, are the learners benefiting from the interaction? Yeah, so I don't know, I think our, our fellows, my yeah. <laughs> other yeah. panelists. Could yeah, you, well, I, I want to bring in Gilbert, but specifically about learning outcomes, because it's really important Teaching is one thing, but the outcome of learning is another. Um, one of the reasons that the, the curriculum was amended was to improve learning outcomes, but also make learners understand a little bit better. Um, during this pandemic, what have you had as feedback from learners about the nature of the curriculum being administered to them, what changes they think could be applied to the curriculum, and what needs to be binned, what needs to be adopted? What is coming out is, Teaching methodologies that put the learner at the center of their learning are being highly appreciated by the students. And that way, when they are encouraged, those of us who did teaching, who started teaching, we had uh, uh, one of the reference books, Farrand, who said that a motivated learner is already half taught. Mm. In the same way, these students get motivated by the methodologies that we use to teach them. They get motivated and that's, they are involved and when they are involved, they are able to retain more because uh, research shows that a student is able to retain up to 90% of what they have learned when they are actively engaged and participating in the learning activity. Mm. Dr. Justin, if I could also bring you in, Oh, and another question is, how do you keep people interested in a varied range of subjects? Um, and I had this complaint from a teacher who was speaking on NTV. Uh, I've taught these kids entrepreneurship. Now they don't want to hear anything about physics and chemistry because with entrepreneurship, they see where they are putting their money, they see the outcomes. How do you keep them engaged before they specialize their knowledge? One, having content that is um, interlinked, for example, the entrepreneurship I'm learning today, how does physics come into the picture? I think the challenge comes in when Justine is physics, done. Gilbert is uh, economics, done. You know, and uh, Raymond is uh, biology, done. Do we, in, when, when you're working in class as a biology teacher, do you ever paint a picture of how physics is important and entrepreneurship for you to master biology? And it goes back to the methodology. Are the instructors prepared? Do I know that as I come in to teach chemistry, I should say, look, if you want to master this concept of, I don't know, chemicals, mixing, sulfur, and something, the economics you learned or you're going to learn will be important here. So I keep an alert. As Gilbert comes in to teach economics, I'm like, mm, let me wait to see how economics links with uh, my sulfur dioxide. So the aspect of getting all the stakeholders on board in their different, uh, remember, when the pandemic came, we were sent home. I'm sure you and me resigned mentally. Mm -hmm. And then we are just walking up, come on, come on, we need to get back to class. I came back with my old methods. She came back with the old methods. 
is there an arrangement for us, the instructors, to be brought on board? Then we can learn how to make the students uh, engage. Number two, Raymond, I'm an ambassador of inclusivity, really. But, and I'm asking myself, in all this that we are discussing, where are the people with challenges? L other than the TV where I had somebody do the sign language, when the teachers are teaching on Zoom, we have different learners people who are physically challenged, people who are mentally challenged. How does ICT-based learning accommodate the different learners? It's really a big challenge. For example, at the university, we have a facility for people with hearing, but when they're at home, how can they do assignments? How can they do their braille work? What is in stock by the government and institutions to make sure that as we move on with a particular group, another group, and, and I come back to Gilbert, I'm giving him this eye of, come on, where are we heading with these people? We are talking about inclusivity, people with physical challenges. But also I want to bring it on the other angle, that we have something to gain from ICT, because if people are teaching using, for example, Teams and the other platforms, where somebody can do a recording and post the video, post the notes, people can always come back to it. But if you're using only Zoom, which is not recorded, for example, if you don't record, I mean, we, are, we have different, so to me, that is an area that I would like us probably to discuss in the next show. How do we talk about inclusivity in the reality of inclusivity? People with challenges, we have people what we call time takers. People usually call them slow, but I don't want to call them slow. They are just time takers. How do you take care of them? And then you have the examples of Gilbert's who are like, the moment they just say something, they are spot on. So that aspect and the aspect of content really is an area we need to discuss if Uganda is going to benefit from ICT-based learning. And we catch up with the world and we move at the same pace. So maybe if you could speak to us about what's the nature of investment that's required, what can partners do? Well, if government is not investing enough, what can partners like the MasterCard, what can partners like um, involved in education do? You know, a number of times we've invested in education and the feeling is when we are investing in education, we want to invest in something we think is going to work. Mm. We don't want to put money in something we think is not going to work. And because of that, previously we have had scenarios where some investment has been made. For example, the purchase of computers and then you distribute you give like 40 computers to a school, that sounds good. Mm -hmm. But if you give a school those 40 computers without the content, you won't have done anything. We instead need to first of all look into the issue of creating a bulk mm -hmm. of content. Mm -hmm. um, I think NCDC going forward, we are going to, as one of the lessons learned mm -hmm. from the pandemic, we need to start putting up content that helps the creators of content out there to learn, mm -hmm. to look at it, because we are talking about methodologies. Mm -hmm. People need to, 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 we need to put best practices out there, because creation of content is not a reserve of NCDC. Every one of us is allowed to create content. And what is there now is, you bring it to us, we evaluate it, we advise you, we say, here, you did not engage the learners, you need to, okay? All the things that we've been talking about here. But we're also going to try and make sure that we put some best practices up there online for whoever wants to create content to benchmark mm -hmm. and build on and create better content. Because we've had so many people creating content in the recent past as a result of the pandemic. And when you look at it, it is all me to you. Mm -hmm. As in, I speak, you listen. Mm -hmm. The level of learner engagement is minimal. So we need to do that content that engages the learner. All right, uh, now we have to get to concluding remarks because uh, our time is really fast spent. Uh, Dr. Justine, if I could start with you. First and foremost, if we are going to move forward with uh, ICT-based learning, we need feedback. We've had a year plus of home learning. Have we really sought feedback from our learners? What have we done as government? What have we done as Makera and the other institutions? 
They come back to school and we rolled into physical learning. There is an opportunity of doing blended learning, but have we sought feedback? Has any school, any institution run a survey under NCDC or under the ministry to see the feelings, to empathize with the learners and co-create what we are going to do next? To me, that is really something very critical. If we are saying ICT is good, it's good for us, is it good for them? What were the experiences? How do we move forward? One, if we go back to traditional teaching, we all go back to class, we're going to lose it. Even when students are back to class, can we within the school setting have a blended learning? And we say, Justin as a teacher is going to do a chemistry class today, but we must be all online. In the event that we are going to go back to e-learning, it will not be strange anymore. But now we've all gone back to sit in class, sit in rows, and I speak. Can we move to blended learning even when students are back to school? Meaning investment in infrastructure. Can the teacher be in the classroom and the students are in the computer lab or in the compound and they are engaging with gadgets? For me, that's otherwise, we are going back to classroom and we are going to lose the momentum. Mm -hmm. oh. All right, uh, Gilbert, what are your concluding remarks on this? My conclu concluding remarks, one of the things that has come out strongly is using methodologies that are subject-centered. Mm -hmm. For example, when I'm teaching math, I don't want to know anything about physics. Mm -hmm. That subject-centered approach, I need to talk to my teachers out there, my fellow teachers, that when you qualify and you go out to the field, you will not use mathematics, you will not use chemistry, but you will use the knowledge that you have acquired, which is a combination of all the learning outcomes that cut across all the subjects. So I will employ you to use integrative approaches. Mm -hmm. Integrative approaches whereby you guide the learner to get a connection from physics, join it with one of, my, of, of chemistry, join it with history, and come up with a product. The world out there needs sol uh, problem solvers, does not need people who are puffed with knowledge. And if you are to solve a problem, for example, making soap, as a simple example, you need someone who has learned to measure, mm -hmm. which is taken from mathematics. You need someone who has learned to take care of the skin, which is taken from the chemistry and the reactions and so on. You also need a person who is able to market that soap. So what you need cuts across. The world out needs a person who cuts across. So it's no longer about your subject, but it is about what the learner is able to do. And that cannot be achieved in only one subject. One subject. Mm. Uh, fine on concluding remarks, Nyangoma. Um. Yeah, so I guess I would like to think more about our responsibility as educators. Um, we have a huge responsibility um, to shape the learners for that world that you're talking about, where at the end of the day, they, they need to be able to do more than just one thing. Um, but I think it also highlights the fact that as teachers, we need to be equipped we need to be equipped to, to em and e employ technology in our, in as, a, our as, a as a tool. Yes, we need to find, we need, to, because many of us actually just embraced it because what it was forced upon us. But now that we can do some basic, you know, things, we can even go further and do more. And I think we can be equipped to even do more in the classroom and expose the children because at the end of the day they're they are going to be in a world that is very technologically advanced. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so they've had an advantage because they've sort of been preempted into it without, by circumstance. But can we then um, do more to empower them to cope? All right, thank you so much, my panelists. This has been a really interesting and engaging conversation. And thank you so much to our viewers who've watched us. This has been EdTech Monday. It comes to you once every month. And we try and dissect the issues within the education and the technology space and how we can continue learning during this pandemic period. Do join us again. And thank you so much for staying with us.